What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is January 7th of 2022. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are and in today's video, I want to spend some time to talk about why I believe crypto markets have a problem. A problem that can be solved but is one that we have to realize and explains why price action has been relatively stagnant over the past year where we've had major upswings and downswings generally leaving us in the same position. I'm not here to be a permable. I want to give you guys the real take on the market and dive straight into the data science, cutting out our biases in order to understand where this market might be and where it could be heading. Okay, so let's go ahead and not push it off any longer, guys, and start off here by talking about some on-chain analytics. One of the key things we need to understand here when we talk about crypto markets, when we talk about equity markets, any asset class out there, is that we need to understand that all markets are determined by inflows and outflows. This is a concept that some of you might be familiar with, as we've talked about it a lot here on the channel. But for those who may not know, this generally is referring to the fact that an asset's price, like Bitcoin, is only going to increase if you have more general inflows on market orders than market orders to the sell side. All right? Sounds very fancy. It basically means you need more people buying than selling, generally speaking, at the existing market price. So the next best available bid, right? the next best available price to buy the asset. Right? Because if you want to generally buy maybe, for example, one Bitcoin, you'll probably actually get it around the same price that you see when you're analyzing the charts or when you're looking at the market. But if, for example, uh, on a given day, you have people buying in total across the world 100,000 Bitcoin, and generally speaking, only generally selling about 75,000 Bitcoin, you're probably going to see a positive impact in price, right? So that's the general principle of inflows and outflows. And it plays vice versa. If you have more sellers than buyers, you probably see prices decline. Right? Now, it's important to understand this concept of inflows and outflows because when we understand that markets are driven by basically demand and the supply of sell side pressure, right? The demand to buy, uh, the sell side pressure of supply, right? We can now start to utilize a variety of metrics to start to showcase how the market is really starting to move on a fundamentals basis. Are we getting more market participants getting into the market or are we really not seeing too much growth? In fact, could we be in a state where we enter into a, a, what would be seen as a bear market or a downturn? Are the metrics really pointing to some serious issues? Well, I want to go ahead and propose today that we're somewhere in the neutral spot right now. And it gives a clear justification as to why we're not seeing prices make a substantial uptrend since as far back as the beginning of 2021. So let's go ahead and start off with one of the most simple data science models we could utilize out there the Bitcoin number of addresses with a non-zero balance. This is just basically analyzing how much Bitcoin addresses are out there with some kind of balance that isn't zero. You could literally have, uh, for example, I think there's a, a certain threshold they have on this. I'll, I'll check in the description. But no, actually, the, in the case of Glassnode here, which we're using, uh, they do not have some kind of minimum threshold of maybe 0 0.01 or 0 0.1 Bitcoin. This is literally including all the addresses that might just have a fraction, even some dust of Bitcoin, right? Like little fractions that aren't even worth sending due to network fees. So we've got nearly, if we take a look at the metric here, right under about 40 million addresses. And in the grand scheme of things, that's great. That's really cool to see that Bitcoin has so many users across the world. And yes, that's not including exchange accounts. It's not excluding, uh, including things like the Lightning Network, right? I don't want to talk about that though, because it is ignorant for us to ignore this metric and what it's showing us with its growth trend. Because generally, even though you do have those extrapolations, you do have exchanges, I guess as time progresses, you'll have less people having self-custodial wallets, which could basically be referring to the majority of the growth we saw in the past, right? And even though there's all these different extrapolations we could pull out of our hat, the fact of the matter is we should be seeing this metric go up as we see crypto adoption go up, right? As more people are getting into the crypto space, there's a certain percentage that are going to want seed phrase wallets or have their own uh, self-custodial wallet of some sort. Well, when we take a look here since 2021, probably around this time in April, right? It's actually generally right here about April towards the close of the month. It's really interesting is we've only seen about an expansion right, of roughly 1.5 to 2 million wallets. 
Now, some might say that that's great, but if we take a look at history and the growth rate here, we can see that we've had very different types of rates of growth. All right? Now, we could flip this on the logarithmic chart. It makes it a bit more difficult to digest the information, but you can generally tell here that the growth you're seeing here in self-custodial wallets over time was much faster in the 2017 cycle. And the idea here is that as we go through each new wave of crypto markets, we should be seeing decaying price action, right? Because it's more difficult to go, for example, from 10K to 100K than it is to go from 1K to 10K, right? Because you're talking about markets that scale much larger markets and much more liquidity needed to drive those rallies. We should see as well, not only growing rates of wallet users, but a growing number in general and what I mean by that is that we shouldn't be stag seeing stagnant growth here. We should be getting even more exponential in the sense of user growth, hitting the S curve effectively, right? And we're not seeing that, right? Now, I understand as much as the next person, some might be saying, Nick, it's institutions, right? It's the large buyers who aren't setting up multiple wallets, but are instead setting up one or a couple of wallets and buying a ton of Bitcoin, right? That's again, another narrative that has been proposed. Well, we can take a look again at the data science models, right? Wallet sizes with over 100 Bitcoin down from a peak in February of 2017 from 18,454 wallets down to a little over 16,000 wallets. Doesn't look like the institutions are swallowing up the entire supply. Well, we could take a look as well at the wallets with over 10 Bitcoin. Well, we've been relatively neutral with this since November of 2016. Doesn't look like a lot of institutions buying to me. We could take a look even at the smaller metrics. Maybe it's not the institutions, maybe it's the, the minnows in this case, right? Like when people utilize whales as a, a metric for people who have like hundreds or thousands of Bitcoin, right? So by the minnows in this case, right? The people who you know might be more everyday people but have been really big and dedicated on Bitcoin, maybe long-term holders, that's been relatively neutral since March of 2020. Now, I am not here to make the case that there are not more buyers in the market than there were in 2017, right? That's important to understand, right? We do have more buyers and that's why prices are generally higher, right? And that's where, again, you can consider the exchanges, you can consider uh, Lightning Network, you can consider all the other arguments that people can make. But the fact of the matter is, we are not seeing the type of demand that people are claiming at least in dollar terms, in the sense of the, um, the necessary amount of buy side pressure to actually drive prices higher for the next rally. Now, some people would say as well that people, Nick, aren't going to be setting up self-custodial wallets or be using the Bitcoin network because the fees are crazy. The fees are ridiculous. Well, actually, fees have been quite good. Only during 2020 and the first half of 2021 did we actually have some fees that might kind of scare people away. But it's so ironic here because not only are fees practically at bare minimum here, right? They're barely scratching the surface compared to where they were back here a couple months ago. But if you even look at it, it's almost as if we're hitting resistance at the, uh, the heights of where fees can really extend to where we used to have support back here in the past in 2016 and 2017. There's nowhere near the demand for Bitcoin transactions now with a variety of other cryptocurrencies in the market that you can use for payments or, for example, you can use for exchange between exchange transfers, right? That kind of arbitrage has been utilized by a lot of people, right? That was infamous back in 2017 with utilizing Litecoin to do inner exchange transfers to cut down on network fees and you swap from Litecoin to Bitcoin on the exchange. So anyways, we're seeing here the network fees aren't holding people back. The question here, that I would like to ask is to think, okay, so we've seen all this new wave of new users coming into the market, right? Really, we, we have seen this over the past couple of months to the last year, right? There's uh, been some research reports that have come out and again, their estimations, but they generally say things along the line of the, over the past year, anywhere from 50 to 80% of all new uh, crypto participants came in the last year, right? In 2021. That's the general metrics that people toss out. And we did see a lot of interest in crypto, right? And sure, there are lots of new applications and avenues to get that exposure to Bitcoin, right? But I want to go ahead and talk about the biggest culprit, 
You guys are here to figure out what's the issue here, right? If there are expansions of users and therefore more buyers coming to the market, I'll pay some potential sellers, right? When it comes to market order flow, right? Buying at the, the best available bidder ask uh, or selling at the best available ask. What's the real culprit here? What's the problem? What's keeping crypto prices from going higher? Specifically, not only Bitcoin, but even other players. Well, there's a metric that I've been hearing people talk about a lot, which is the exchange metric, the all exchanges metric for balances on exchanges, right? Like the amount of Bitcoin or, you know, we can do this through Ethereum and other assets, how much of it is living on exchanges. And this is generally touted as a very bullish metric, right? We had for years more Bitcoin hitting exchanges, which overall would, uh, in many cases, scare people into thinking that there's more sell side pressure, right? But putting that aside, many people looked at the decline here throughout 2022 and 2021, the continuous decline and low levels that we've seen here, cutting a couple percentage points off is a really bullish sign, right? That the institutions or other players are buying large chunks of Bitcoin and they're storing it in cold storage or they're taking it off exchanges and stuff and holding it for the long term. The real institutional players, the hedge funds, uh, the uh, family funds, all the types of different parts of the institutional world just, just swallow the Bitcoin, the corporate treasures, right? Like MicroStrategy. Well, not to say that that stuff isn't going on, but it is not the main reason for this decline. And I'll go ahead and say that with pure confidence, guys, because we can see very clearly through another metric that a lot of that Bitcoin is going somewhere else. One thing that people unfortunately don't do enough within the crypto space is they don't make sure, and this I am guilty of this, I think everyone is at the end of the day because we want to look for signs that will meet our narrative, right? One of the things that we need to be careful of is to make sure our data sources are accurate and that we don't just trust labels. This is why I've been critical of the almost religious, zealous nature of people following things like the stock to flow model or any one particular data science model. Many people thought the pie cycle top indicator um, was a clear sign that we were in a bear market. It was the one data science model that was flipping that we were in a bear market. And lo and behold, we're still generally holding up and having mid-cycle corrections so far, right? But take a look at this down here. This metric is addressing a certain subset of exchanges. It says all exchanges, right? And I'm not here to rail glass node. Some of these data sources are not available to us. But what this is measuring is the amount of Bitcoin generally on spot exchanges, okay? So this does include a lot of major exchanges here. It includes Binance. It includes FTX, right? It includes Bitfinex, Bitthumb, Bitmex, Bitstamp, Bitrix, Coinbase, right? Gemini, a lot of different players here. But you want to know what it's not including? The metric that this is not including within the all exchange metric. It's not including the futures and options market, at least from what I can tell here. Now, I want to go ahead and talk about why that's a big deal. And also why it's a big deal that it's not tracking the amount of Bitcoin as well, not only on derivatives platforms where people leverage trade, but also within the borrowing and lending platforms of the crypto market. So we have two major disorientations here, um, uh, things that are starting to affect how markets generally operate in crypto. Crypto for the last uh, near decade was almost untouched in a sense. It didn't have a mass exposure to derivatives as par to spot volume. Now we need to talk a little bit about what the difference is between these two. For those who may not know, spot volume is uh, exchange volume or trading activity that happens on a traditional exchange with real fiat currency buying real crypto. Think of your Coinbase's, your Binance's, uh, Bitstamp, Bitrix, right? Places where you would go with real money and you would go buy crypto, right? And you actually could withdraw that crypto and you'd own it. You could keep it in the exchange. Either way, there is real crypto for real dollars or euros or pounds and it's being traded and there's price discovery. That is spot markets. On the other hand, we have derivatives markets. Derivatives markets include futures contracts, options, contracts for difference, all kinds of different fancy labels. The general thesis here this is, though is this, you are not trading 
real Bitcoin. You may be using Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies as kind of a form of collateral or as an account balance, but what you are really trading is paper contracts. Paper contracts that trade on top of the spot market. All right. So give an example of this. In the stock market, you have options contracts, right? And options contracts can help to protect or hedge you. Um, for example, if you wanted to re remove or mitigate the concerns of volatility and maybe an underlying stock position, right? And that's one of the ways you could use options. There's also futures contracts where you can trade um, basically to protect yourself, maybe as a farmer, right? Um, you could buy a futures contract for wheat that will settle and make sure that you get a designated amount of wheat in this case, no matter what the price does in the market. Right, so that's how derivatives usually are used. They're usually supposed to be used to protect you and to hedge risk. Unfortunately, in a highly volatile market like crypto, which already does phenomenally well over the long term compared to other assets, people have gotten greedy. And most importantly, not just have they gotten greedy, they, especially people like myself, content creators, there have been a ton of content creators who have propagated a terrible trend in this space. Right? Not just YouTubers, Twitter influencers, traders alike, anyone you can think about. They've propagated the biggest derivatives market to asset spot market difference I've seen in history. Right Now, equity markets and a couple others, if you really bring out the broad derivatives market, maybe it's more. Right, But here, this is what's really disorienting markets. Because that exchange outflow that you saw here on this metric that everyone is saying is bullish, is really sucking in Bitcoin into derivatives markets. All those new users who have Bitcoin, or maybe in this case dollars or some form of value, they're going to the derivatives platforms. Their buy side pressure is now no longer going onto the spot exchanges. Right? And along with that as well, people are losing their money. They're getting liquidated, right? Because they're taking on too much excessive risk. They're trading on 3x leverage, 5x leverage, 10x leverage, to only where if a mere 10% decline happens in Bitcoin's price, they could end up losing it all. And I can promise you guys, you can look at the data here on CoinGlass. This is another major uh, data science provider. And look at the liquidation metric and see the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars that are lost on a daily basis due to leverage trading in these futures and options platforms. It's absolutely insane. All right. So again, you can see here the USD value of the open interest here, right? We've got lots of liquidity here, liquidity that should be on spot markets. Unfortunately, though, is in these different platforms, trading derivatives. And there are your big names, Binance, FTX, right? Which again, should be included in the metric, but is only the spot record holdings right right so again just to show how prevalent this is right you've got the chicago mercantile exchange the cme one of the biggest traditional exchanges in the world doing a fraction of the volume of binance and ftx these companies and another one they're not including well they actually they do have here and stuff that wasn't mentioned in the metric earlier this kind of proves this point of futures uh, contracts not being in introduced is exchanges like bybit right and Deribit, other players out there that again have swallowed the attention of users, new buyers in the market that should be buying spot Bitcoin so they can have real ownership of Bitcoin and who shouldn't be dealing with leverage. Unfortunately, though, there is a plague going on in the crypto market. And it's no wonder why we're seeing the kind of price action we have right now. Now, I'd say that as well. And I'll tell you guys, I've done it myself, right? I know what this does to price, right? The other thing as well is taking out a crypto loan. Now you have companies, for example, like Celsius, you have companies like BlockFi, uh, you have all kinds of different platforms and they are great reputable platforms that I think offer a great interest bearing opportunity for depositors, as well as the ability to borrow for a variety of reasons. But what we have seen in the crypto space is that a lot of people are taking their crypto collateral, they're taking their Bitcoin, Ethereum, their crypto holdings that they have, they're locking it up on these platforms and borrowing dollars, to a traditional bank account or exchange account and or they're borrowing stable coins and what are they doing with that well they do exactly what we did back in may at the proper time you're supposed to do this and that is when there's blood in the streets right we came in and we bought more crypto with our stable coins and you can do that it's totally fine right but 
The problem is you have the same risk of liquidation as you would on trading on derivatives, right? If, for example, uh, the collateral that is backing up your loan goes down enough, you can have a liquidation event where they sell your underlying crypto and you lose it all. And that causes a cascade of sell side pressure on the spot market. And that's exactly what we saw back here during um, May of 2021, right? And it's exactly what we're seeing right now. It's exactly what we saw back here in early December. It causes a cascade. And the worst element of it is, is that you not only are having a cascade of sell side pressure, but the order book on the spot market is more thin than ever because all of that Bitcoin and all that value, right? The traditional value in the market is now over on derivatives markets, right? So you don't have the buy side pressure to save price that you used to. You don't have the bids on the order book, the buyers who are willing to pay at a lower price, but again, will help to keep price more leveled, right? Now it's just the sellers are just a domino effect because when you're covering uh, for these loans, for the depositors, you have to take the borrower's collateral and just sell it, sell it, sell it, sell it. Make sure that you sell it so you can provide and cover for those depositors if the borrower goes belly up, right? That's exactly what we've got going on here. And if we take a look at open interest here, right? This is the chart here that kind of shows you guys the most important thing of all, right? Take a look at Binance here, for example, right? Look at price and then the green line here, which is the open interest on the market. We have just as much open interest as we had back in May of 2021. And price, in the meantime, has declined from 63K down here towards 41K. The problem is not going away. It is getting worse. People are not learning their lesson. Crypto at this point, for many people, is nothing more than a casino. And that's a tragic outcome for this market. I hate seeing this because it, for many people, is not only doing two things. One, it's making crypto more volatile for everyday spot users, which is obviously not fun, right? But outside of that as well, it's taking away one of the greatest life-changing opportunities we have to invest in from everyday people and instead leaving them with losing every penny that they put into it, if not the vast majority of it. That's why on this channel, you will never see me promoting leverage trading. And even when it comes to taking real crypto loans, look, I took one out back in May, but I did it at a time where it's the best to take it because you already have a decline in the value of your collateral where there's little to no risk of your collateral lowering, right? So you do not want to two crypto loans. And I'll say it here first, I recommend that people just generally don't touch crypto loans, but if you are going to do it, make sure to do it at a time when your collateral is already pulled back in value, not when the market is frothy and excited. And I would generally, again, emphasize it's not financial advice, but I can tell you all, it's probably best to leave things like that to people who know about the important things uh, to do. And you may know exactly what to do in that scenario. I'm not here to speak about your knowledge on the situation, but I can tell you guys the statistics are in my favor on my point. The vast majority of people are going, the vast, vast majority of people are going to lose money leverage trading and taking out crypto loans at the wrong time. You are much better off to simply hold and play the long game to trade the broader cycles without leverage, without immense speculation and risk. And if you can do that over the long term, either simply hodling or trading those broader cycles, I can guarantee you guys, you will have a much higher chance of succeeding against the counterparts who are leverage trading, who are taking excessive risk. I can't drill it enough. I'm only gonna be here to tell you guys what's most important for you, right? I'm not here to make a quick buck. And one thing that's important you guys should know about I'm not here to be closed minded, uh, but I will tell you this. If a YouTuber is promoting a leverage trading platform, and I'll name some of them, there's Bybit, there's FTX, uh, Binance, of course, futures or options, right? If you have anyone who's promoting these platforms, Darabit, um, I could name so many other names out there. If you see someone promoting leverage trading, go ahead and unsubscribe from them. At least don't take what they say uh, more than with a grain of salt. Because when you get liquidated, they make money in the vast majority of cases. That doesn't seem very beneficial, does it? It almost seems as if they'd want to encourage you to trade more than you need to, to take more risk than you need to, 
at no cost to them, in fact, a benefit of them. You guys won't be seeing any referral links to these platforms under my description, case in point. So anyways, guys, um, that's it for today's video. I, I hope um, we can at least realize this problem. And I think, you know, a lot of you might be wondering, you know, Nick, it doesn't look like we're going to be fixing this anytime soon. Maybe I don't have any power over fixing it as an individual. What do I do? Well, you do what everyone else isn't doing. Where you feel comfortable, buy the dips, and focus on the long term. Because these users will continue to get flushed out. And when there's peak pain in the market, as we've talked about, when there's peak sell site pressure on the spot market. Smart money, institutions who know how to read this market, they're going to buy in. They will buy these discounted dips in the market. They will take these opportunities. They're not trading on leverage. They're not taking excessive risk because maybe they didn't get in Bitcoin when it was 5K or 10K. They're just buying in because they can see the long-term roadmap that crypto assets, once there's enough pain, will rebound inevitably and continue higher. In an economy with excessive money printing, lowered interest rates, a generation of easy money. We're in it for the long game. I'll be here during bull and bear markets through good and bad times. And I'll see to it that this journey is something that we all share together. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, consider dropping a like. It's one of the best ways you can support the channel. And uh, one thing that I, I know I always emphasize, so I'm sorry for beating it like a dead horse. Uh, if you are subscribed to the channel, that is great. Um, but if you haven't already, consider hitting the bell icon. You only have to do it once, um, and that will make sure that you get notified for all videos that come out here on the channel. So you don't miss an upload. Sometimes YouTube will not notify you of all videos, even if you're subscribed. So thanks so much, guys, for watching letting me ramble on today, letting me get a bit emotional on it because I do care about crypto markets in the long run. I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.